Welcome for another Café Realist, and today I am joined by a, an old friend of the show, supporter of the show, and uh, more than a, than a friend, but the, a representative of, of an organization. Uh, welcome, Kat, and could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Kat. I'm uh, director of Roleplay Haven. Um, I'm also a very keen role player, anyway. And I think I've, actually I have. I've appeared on a on a podcast before with um, with Jeremy uh, doing Nominee. Oh yeah, that's true. I, I was even yeah in my mind it, it was slightly fresher the the UK Games Expo uh, interviews. I, I did one or, so, or or twice. Uh, yeah, but the Nominee game that's. That's from a, a while ago. I, I'd like to make a sequel to that, but uh, yeah, it was a uh, motley crew of people, <laughs> so having people back it was. together. Yeah, it, it, I really enjoyed it because I'd never actually previously heard of the game. Um, I have actually got a copy of the the English translation, um, and I've, I've been sort of toying with maybe running it myself. But I must admit, while I love the world and I love the way you can design the characters. I have to say the dice system does <laughs> slightly and there's a bit too much calculation involved in there for me. Yeah, because that must be uh, first of all uh, we mentioned that in the episode but the the US adaptation is is kind of infamous in France uh because it toned down a lot of things which well you could argue about whether or not the they are appropriate today <laughs> because some you know it was highly disrespectful or playing with depending where you on which side of the fence you are but uh yeah it yeah. was very i guess the word is irreverent towards religion <laughs> in general so yeah so that was watered down uh a lot when it was adapted to the us and and pretty much that's 99 percent of the game so if you water that down there's not much left and uh, and in yeah. Fran the Fran in france the game has gone through multiple editions and of course changes in their game system so yeah if it's the very first one that must be a that must be rough yeah yeah it, it, there um i do agree with you the translation of it is quite watered down um and you know i, I kind of relied on there's a few there's still some very old blog posts from people who were playing it who are playing it in france and other places and finding English versions of the blogs where they kind of make more suggestions about what you should be bringing in. I do think Nominee for the English speaking audience does need a revamp, particularly now we've got Cult and a lot of other different darker games out there now. I think the time is about right. And people, while we do have, still have some problematic people in the gaming world, I think we do have far more mature players now who can play with themes that are a little bit darker or irrelevant when it comes to religion and do it in a sensible and you know a fun story way yeah i'd be curious to see that uh actually yesterday chaosium just announced that they're gonna uh publish and distribute a adaptation of a french game it's called worm um uh, yeah. which you know, it's is set in the uh, uh what's the word uh prehistoric times so you're uh, i guess you got a stone plus one and you can bash the head <laughs> of a saber tooth oddly enough we um i have actually started playing in a game of worm um where friends brought uh massively likes buying pdfs of, of game systems and he has and he's trying now to work his way through all of the games he's brought he's actually got a spreadsheet of where he's played it and the rankings wow uh, so we are doing that we are playing worm um, there's some interesting points where we have to look up words where someone's translated it in French and they've just gone for the first word in the translation because it's a tricky word. And one of them, we're looking at it and it was like a plasm. And we're looking at it, but this is a healing thing. They must mean poultice or something similar. So we, we, we ignored that, but you don't quite get your rock. You do get, uh, you get to make your own sort of flint spears and stuff as well. So it's quite dangerous because, um, I've, I must admit, I've never played quite in a system where if you do manage, like we, we were, we were hunting uh, deer, where if you do a successful hit, you've got to roll to see if your weapon breaks. Wow. Oh, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. That, that's serious then. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've we've now, our uh, small tribe thinks that there's possibility another tribe have cursed us with an evil spirit that might be um, hiding, unfortunately, in a mountain lion. <laughs> so... Uh, 
our brave little troop of, of young men who want to prove themselves are going up against a mountain lion next session where we've got to track it down. So that's going to be interesting. I, I was quite glad to see Chaosium are going to release it because it, it's quite a nice system. I'm not sure how long a campaign can last with it, but I do love the uh, the narrative that the game provides for you. Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's... I mean, I think you. I, I, I'm always keen to play is more historical stuff, and uh, I could imagine you could. So people were suggesting. I was reading French reviews. Uh, often people play k kind of Call of Cthulhu stories, almost. But you know, you don't necessarily have to make it um, obvious that there's something uh, fantastic or supernatural happen, because yeah. from the point of view of prehistorical people the explanation might always be mystical although the, it, there's a natural cause it can be a uh, some yeah. gas or something just just a natural phenomenon they, they're not aware yeah. of so you could go on on a quest against uh, a disease or something like that and think there's a there's a magical thing behind it while you what you are doing is picking up the remedies or, or things like that or even just moving your group thinking that where you are your cave's been cursed moving to somewhere that suddenly now has fresh water running so you're not um drinking dirty water could suddenly cure you and it's like the curse has been released you know has, has left um and i quite like the way that steve has done that because the chances are logically thinking about the mountain lion is just picking us off because we're a small group we go out hunting on our own quite often so we're easy to pick off and maybe it's injured so that's why it's going after us rather than say a big deer or something but we don't know that you know for, for us we've been cursed you know we found these strange marker stones we we just assume that we are you know we're in trouble so you know and that's what i quite like because it's that called a cthulhu thing as you said you know you don't have to have that you know cthulhu appear or a dark one or a deep one rather because it's silly things like um i i remember once playing in a game which was set in world war one our characters, after a bomb blast, we were feeling sickly, lethargic, couldn't keep food down, blisters, sores, and every, we straight away were thinking this supernatural creature. We're having to make sand uh, saving throws against sand loss, etc. And right at the end of it, because we did ask, you know, what was that? And it's radiation. Well, our characters never would have heard of radiation back then. So, you know, being suffering from radiation sickness, we actually thought we were up against some really major uh, Cthulhu mythos creature. And it just, it's something as simple as radiation. Yeah, I think it's where science explains it, the mythology gets lost. That, that's, uh, even when I play Call of Cthulhu, that I prefer the slow burn stories uh, like that. Mm. Uh, when I, I only played once Masks of Nyarlathotep and uh, we didn't go further than... Uh, than London, but I was a bit disappointed at one point of the campaign. Uh, spoiler alert uh, for for anyone, uh, and I don't know if it's part of the the actual campaign. But we ran into a a painting which was which, which had properties which which were ongoing, and I thought it was a bit of a pity because you could take the painting and do stuff with it. Because as player, that's that's what you do. Uh, I mean, a bit like. Not quite, but like the Ark of the Covenants in uh, Raiders of the Lost Lost Ark, uh, you could hold it, hold it somewhere, open it, it does its stuff, and then you close it. But it's 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 still supernatural, but it's uh, a phenomenon which you can reproduce again and again. And it it was more limited than the Raiders of the Lost Ark things, of course. But since it becomes something you can replicate again and again, it, it's not. It's not supernatural anymore. It's not weird anymore. It's just yeah. something unexplained. It's you. You just found a portal of some kind, and I, I too yeah. so, so early in the campaign, it was a bit of a pity. Or even, yeah, even stuff we did in New York in the first arc. I, I always too. It. I. I know, sometimes I don't know where to play the character because at what point does the character. I always. I often start like, yeah, I don't believe in those uh, non-scientific stuff. But then you witness things with your character which are so blatantly anormal that as a yeah. as a role player I'm like, yeah, actually I would have preferred that 
go there much slower so I can play the madness because if you, you see a crazy yeah. creature and you just snap immediately, it's like, okay, right, I saw something weird. Where, where, where am I going with that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's why I think um, campaigns, I think certain games like Call of Cthulhu do come across better in a campaign, particularly if you're with a group that you you can that you trust and you can work together. Because I do like, as you say, that slow burn of madness slowly creeping in. Because you can, you know, start off as somebody who's, I don't know, investigating a, a spooky house because you've got, I don't know, a podcast trying to de debunk old ghosts in old homes. But slowly during the course of like a, a week's investigation at a place, you're going to come across something that is going to slowly just drip into your mind. You know, and being able to play that drip of madness more slowly, you know, getting more twitchy every time you hear a door slam, even if it's just your mate slamming the car door, because you've heard it so often and you know there's no way that door could have slammed. You know, it's it, you just build more for the character. You can uh, get a greater empathy for them. And also the story of the breakdown of mental states in Call of Cthulhu is just brilliant over a campaign. As much as you can say it's brilliant, because obviously you still... <laughs> You know, a mental health thing, but it, to be able to do a theatrical version, which the which Call of Cthulhu is, is just brilliant role play. Yeah, and I, and I think if you do it slow, it also allows you to to keep the door open because if it had yeah. been slow, you can always wonder, okay, my character saw that, but was there something? Or that, that's my preferred one shot of Call of Cthulhu is that I can leave them thinking, we don't know if this happened or if it was a something in the head or, or of the characters like yeah. maybe one of my favorite sort of call of cthulhu-esque stories uh right now uh, right now the uh, i was mentioning to you uh, i'm do taking the notes for a campaign on world anvil at the moment so this is a french campaign which was written in the 90s for call of cthulhu delta green so it was contemporary setting and they re-released it for their own system called uh, Chroniques Oubliées. I don't think there's an English version. It was initially a medieval fantasy system and they, they made a contemporary version and they re-released the campaign. And you are FBI agents and where we are, we are at the third session, very short sessions played online. We are investigating, we are shadowing a uh, senator who might be embroiled with things in 2016 in things of corruption. Uh, uh, mismanagement of campaign money and this sort of things and so I expected to go slow burn but the game master the way the, the, the visuals and the music he picked for the mood uh, is influenced it's very clearly True Detective like the mm. first season and for me True Detective is one of my favorite sort of Call of Cthulhu things there's nothing except yeah it's not even a spoiler but there's stuff towards the end which happened but they clearly b could be just hallucinations by the yeah. character. If you take the whole story, there's, there's nothing but the slow uh, burn of sanity points by the character yeah. because of what they, they're confronted with. Yeah. And also, the, the nice thing about the slow burn is that some of the role play you're doing is not just what you're seeing and um, hearing or experiencing. It's it's the own it's the sort of mental back um process in your own mind where you start to double question yourself and when you as a character start to double question oh he i oh, would just laugh that up and then you go and then you just do that pause where the kind of goes well on the other hand perhaps we should look into this uh, maybe tomorrow in sunlight and that sort of it, that coupled with the sand loss more fun and believable as well um, funny enough, with, with sand loss and um, madness, the only thing I really I find with Call of Cthulhu is how the uh, the madness is manifest, what you get if you do get a really bad role. Um, I quite like the way that Shadows of Estrian, when you create your character, you do have a you you pick the the type of lines that if you were to go mad, how that would work with your character. It would be, um, I don't know, great depression, um, whether it would be some kind of mania. I like the way they do that, and I, I do wonder whether to do a, a, a slight, 
I, I do dislike doing house rules, I must admit, but I do wonder if doing Call of Cthulhu, but actually when you design your character, taking that system from Shadows Estrian and, and getting that to work together with Call of Cthulhu could work quite nicely with the sound. Yeah, rather than have something random, have something which brings you deeper in the psyche of your character. Yeah. Um, funny thing, I just got <laughs> delivery from Amazon. I'm gonna pick it up. It's in front of the door. Be right back. No worries. It's like being stuck at a work interview where you know the interviewer goes, "Oops, I need to go and sort something off screen." Oh. Live from London. <laughs> we don't cheat, huh? It's, it's a role uh, playing book. <laughs> uh, it's it's actually something for hopefully will improve my streaming. Uh, I got an issue with the I got a better headset which I got for Christmas, but the microphone is not working. So uh, I bought a USB thingy which I hope will improve things. And ah, awesome. So yeah, we'll see. Whew, sorry, I've been running. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so uh, we got a question from the chat room. Uh, Kat, what's your favorite genre of RPG? I, I must say, I'm impressed by the number of French tables of role-playing games you seem to have played and be aware of. That's really, really cool. So Shadows of Esteran, Innomine Satanis, and, <laughs> and Worm. It's like, wow, that's cool. I should get in touch with your, your game master because I'd like to showcase more French tables of role-playing games, but uh, I need more game masters <laughs> who can who are interested to do it in English. Yeah. So yeah. Um, favorite genre of role playing games. Um, if we're not talking systems, um, because I, then I would say it's good old fashioned, um, probably noir, horror noir, preferably. So I would, um, I would encompass Vampire in that as well, Call of Cthulhu, uh, Shadows Estrian, Simbaran, all those type of games where you can play that horror, um, but with some investigation in there. So I'd say more sort of like horror noir, if that's even a category, which I suspect I've just made my own up. But uh... when I when I use sometimes it's contemporary occult, because that... yeah, that that would work, yeah. Because I think that's what. Nephilim was called, and Nephilim is one of my favorite games. So I, I like those, and uh, I must say, I'm, uh, yeah, the the table I'm playing at the moment it's it's a bit challenging because it's with my very first proper game master and and team of players from when I was younger in Belgium. They because of COVID nineteen, they said, uh, oh, we're gonna play our usual games but online, and we're gonna start a new campaign. And they open it up to myself and other people who are not in the area. So I haven't played with them in uh, maybe a dozen years, even more. So, yeah. so on one hand, uh, it's a bit challenging because they uh, is going to come across as very judgmental, but they still play like we played in the late nineties. Uh, uh, the French speaking, they're not very interested in the different blogs and podcasts with advice for game masters so there's a lot of stuff in terms of uh, safety tool narration sharing which are mm. Mm, i find it um and lacking might not be the right word but uh it's a bit of a pity i find because uh yeah, yeah it's it's not the things which could definitely improve the game i think but with that said uh, the game master is way way more experienced uh, he's got way way more experience game mastering and uh, weekly practice than I ever have so he's still m m a better game master than me yeah. in some aspects but uh, it's nice to play something contemporary because you can go very deep in the character I find you can relate yeah. a lot to them I'm not saying it's impossible with medieval fantasy or older things but there are definitely um, what's the word there are ropes being thrown at you uh, for an instance I created a character uh so FBI agents got troubles with his family, uh, single father, couple siblings. And the other day I was listening to stuff. Uh, I decided to make the character uh, queer. So he's, uh, he's homosexual. And 
and he's kind of in the fast of furious vein in terms of character he is uh the driver the the more action man uh but one thing i was thinking at, m at what moment was oh it would be fun if he was actually fan of karaoke and especially doing karaoke songs of disney and to, oh it's cool oh, okay. there's the song uh uh, Let it go, which I, I really like myself, and uh, it's uh, it's kind of kind of a coming out song anthem. And I I looked it up, and I said, oh no, 2016. Actually, when the session happened, it's not released yet. So what is released? Oh, Moana is released, and I had just seen Moana. And I said, oh wait, hang on a minute. Maybe not only my character is a fan of karaoke, uh, but it's a tradition of his family who's kind of uh, recomposed but tight knit. To go see Disney movies together, and I made up a a little story of something happened with, before the start of the campaign when they went the three of us. So uh, my character, his half brother, his half sister, and his father, they all went to see Moana. And the funny bit was that, uh, and I started picturing myself in the, at the movies with, with, as this character with his par his father and family. And then I realized that the main song kind of related to the character because he joined the FBI he wants to move away from the family the family is tightly knit so they don't see that from they're not happy about that so at some point the idea was he said okay let's do something fun this weekend I'm going to be graduated uh, in a couple of days uh, it's that my last weekend off let's all go see a, a Disney movie they go see Moana and in it there's a song uh, which is called uh, Ofa I'll Go which is uh, I could imagine it would make actually the family very uncomfortable because it's all about yeah. I'm the daughter in the village you want me to stay in the village and on the island and I want to go away and do uh, do stuff so I made this this little story explaining how they went to the movies being like okay we're gonna change our mind and then they saw the movie and the mood was really cold getting out of the movie because they, they all found it kind of awkward sitting through that song and the rest of the movies uh, knowing what's what what was their own situation yeah. and yeah it's it's funny because you can see things in your daily life and, and start to go deep and say okay what's their hobby what do they do and so on yeah yeah i must admit i'd like it when i'm when i make up characters when i do get to to play i love finding a hobby or something that they can do um, and it may not be even be related to any hobbies that I personally at that point in time have, um, because there's always something that gives you a little um, insight into them, even before you, you know, because describing how someone physically looks doesn't create a character. It's the mental processes in the background, um, how, you know, even into how they treat the postman when he turns up at the door, you know, that that I love doing. That's a good um, question. That's very really cool. Yeah, it, it's just trying to find something that to hang the character's personality on, you know. And I always do struggle because after a while you do realise that sometimes you're starting to pick the same things. And I I don't I I do play with people who do play the same variant of character every time, the same personality. And that's fine. If you're happy doing that, go for it. But I like to change them around a bit. So I do like to play characters who can be upper class pompous assholes to be fair sometimes um but i also do like you know playing somebody who you know um is in unfailably cheerful and will always find the best in, in people and you know I've, I've played that character in vampire before which is amazing how much that can annoy everybody because you always look on the plus side to yes we're we're five boons in here yeah but it's fine because until they're resolved you know that type of cheerful character so and you know knowing that they've got a hobby that they like either working a soup kitchen or writing poetry um or even graffiti art i think i picked once which was a bit bizarre because i ended up um, researching banksy a lot and i had this whole idea of him of uh, him wanting to uh, be bigger than banksy trying to sort of outdo Bank banksy in london um and got arrested quite a lot <laughs> Yeah, I did that with Star Trek also. Uh, I was not a player, I was a game master, but I picked hobbies and quirks for most of my non-playing characters. Uh, 
and and sometimes you pick stuff because they contrast you know on one hand is uh, a contradiction to the character but then you you work out an explanation why they are they are into that like i had a a vulcan so so they were all cadets and one cadet npc she was a vulcan but at some point she developed a an interest into one hit wonders of uh, uh late 20s and early 21st century uh uh so-called popular music <laughs> so so each time the player would visit her she would be she would be playing songs uh yeah which i had listened uh about in uh, one of my favorite youtube show which is called uh Todd in the shadows and he got this show called one it wonderland where, where he explored those songs and but it was like oh that's a logical vulcan why would she listen to that well actually she's listening to it because she thinks that's a way tr to understand human culture to go into this this weird notion of one it wonder because what what does is what what is it fame uh or can it be just one hit yeah. you know if a, an artist is good the artist is good uh, so she was studying the the modes of production uh rewarding the artists and so on I, I'm actually now imagining you know if aliens were to look at the at, the, at this planet possibly not at this uh, period in time but say last year they'd kind of assume instead of um instead of uh, the first world countries going to war they decide to battle it out every year with the eurovision song contest and that's how they decide their arguments because <laughs> you can kind of see them looking at that with the commentaries um because um i always thought uh, terry wogan and graham norton were quite cutting in their commentaries about other countries songs but then I have heard the translations of others of other countries, and they're just as cutting. So I can just see that you know, a Vulcan would be researching our history and assuming this is how we resolve things. You know, it's it's um, it's interesting. You know, on one hand, there's two aspects. Uh, I, I've missed a, a couple of the last time, but for for random reason, uh, it's been several times. I was visiting the family in Belgium when. The Eurovision happened, and in Belgium, it's yeah. I guess it's big in the UK, but yeah, in in Belgium, it's 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 very big too. And uh, I guess each place had the the singer in the eighties, nineties, uh, different decades, which managed to win. But on one hand, you know, when they start giving out the points, there's definitely something oddly political yeah. about it. Social political. You can see yeah. groups of countries. And so you got this aspect you look at and you're like, yeah, of course, this and this country, of course, they would support each other. And then next to me, I got my mother, who's very, very snarky and drops bone like, well, of course, Malta would give out points to, to this country. Oh. <laughs> and and <Yeah>. very, <laughs> very, very upset about the, the whole deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last time I saw yeah. the UK were if I was just when Brexit was voted, so the the UK was really oh. not very popular that year. Well, the the thing is, a lot of the other countries they 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 actually do proper voting ages ago, you know, in and let the people decide. We don't kind of really do that, um, and yeah, the English one is never good. Let's face it, the UK entry is usually quite diabolical, um, but I. <laughs> You know, it's one of those sort of things, unfortunately. Um, I must admit, the, the tactical voting thing always makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. But now, I, I, to be fair, I'm now just still imagining a Vulcan listening to these sort of songs as, as a way of understanding humans. I don't know <laughs> if they will be back for 2021, but oh, there was... There's always a Scandinavian country which does something uh, slightly more interesting. And, and this year, there was... Ah, must have been Finland or Iceland. They, they their video clip uh, started to be popular on Twitter, and uh, yeah, they they had a little something special uh, yeah. to to them going yeah. on. Yeah, I think because they tend to, I, I think because the way they they public vote for it, um, they do tend to have a more interesting song. Um, to be fair, France isn't normally too bad. Uh, Germany can be very random. I'll be honest. German ones can be really good one year, and then the next year you're like, "What? What's this?" 
Um, the French commenters and... are among the worst, though. I mean, I can follow a couple countries since I play I speak English, French, and a bit a few other languages. The French commenters, they're so full of themselves. Uh, they, they. Uh, I mean, the the British one are 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 tough, but the French one, yeah, I would punch them. <laughs> Men or women, no discrimination. I would punch the French commenters of the Eurovision. They're so obnoxious. But it's a it's a long tradition with sports. It's it's like that as yeah. well. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, <laughs> I, I always like actually something that I like the Eurovision for being able to go onto YouTube and seeing what um, other countries' uh, presentations of it were because I love that whole, I've seen ours, but I, now I can go on YouTube and see every, what everyone else has seen and hear some of the commentary, which I love. And I, I think that's the great thing about the Eurovision. Um, that, in fact, you can turn it into drinking contest. <laughs> <laughs> So let's let's try to segue that back into gaming. Yeah. Uh, watch out! I'm gonna I'm gonna do a uh, a double salto here. Uh, so you could almost have a Eurovision of the role play heaven, can you? Because you got whales, you've got Plymouth, you got different regions. So what's going yeah. on at the role play heaven? Are you doing a, a role play vision uh, of tabletop role playing online at the moment? Well, we've not got uh, we've not got everyone to vote for each other's favourite games yet. Although I'm now tempted to have the GMs put, post up like a two paragraph of how their game's going, and we could do the voting. Um, it's going okay. Um, obviously, with the closures of any venues, we've moved online. Uh, we're supporting our GMs by uh, we've increased the technical speak that I don't really kind of get but we've increased our discord channel so that people can use it for the speech part we have got little dice bots rolling around but I think most people are using us for the using um, our discord groups they have their own chat set up for their group for that game they're using that for the verbal side but then using things like roll 20 astral and a couple of the others to do the the maps and the, the other bits so it's been quite smoothish actually touch wood because you know it's, it's online it, it's a very different thing from opening a club and everyone seeing each other um but the the community's grown really well um everyone's enjoying themselves and as i say a lot for a lot of our gamers some for some of them this is still one of the only games they've got running which is great that they're turning up every week because we're still sticking to the club nights that they would do normally run uh, but I do know a few of the others are now, there are a few people into group meeting now to do some sort of inter club meetings. And uh, there's a bit of a call to increase that as well, particularly as we don't know how long this is going to go on for yet. So, but no, it's, it's going well. I think everyone's enjoying themselves, um, which is, you know, happy members, uh, happy GMs and players. So, so yeah, because hopefully we might see you online because you were, Saying this will be a bit easier for you, particularly with travel. Yeah, yeah, I should definitely come try to come join a, a game of the roleplay. Even uh, I need to. Yeah, I was busy lately because uh, I was editing the the final part of that actual play I recorded back in October, and uh, there's been two Dragon Meat episodes in in the middle. But uh, yeah, I released the first back in mid November, so yeah, I was like, Oof, yeah. I'm, I'm finally done. This week I already have two games, but yeah, I could I could definitely join because on one hand you're saying it's not the same as playing together at the club, but knowing the role play heaven, uh, I mean you got so many branches even across London and not speaking of Plymouth and I mean let's do pick a, a, a Plymouth and Wales, it's actually quite difficult to some sometimes uh, sometimes people would stick to one branch. And then they they don't even I assume show up as much to the the Christmas party with one another. So here you get an opportunity to do stuff together. I assume. Yeah, I mean here we do have that opportunity. People can do um, stuff all together. They've also got the um, advantage. To, to be fair, we do have within the London clubs we do have people who do attend two or I think in one player's case I do know one guy who turns up to three of them. Um, wow. Obviously, got more spare time than than I do, which but it is lovely if you can get in all your gaming. But here, where we're online, as as you've said, there is no travel now. Um, it does make it a little bit more easier for people. 
the nice thing is is that everyone can now everyone's using discord more there is the the general chat and chat on rpgs etc so people can go online and chat to each other a lot more easier and it is nice to to meet up with some of the guys from wales um, and plymouth just to be able to say hi and sort of get involved in a chat on you know what's your favorite rpgs and stuff because you know we're all kind of stuck in our own houses and it is a bit isolated and it is nice to meet people online who you know are going to be nice people back to you and you can just have a chat without worrying about who you might meet online because that you know it's still one big club everyone i mean we're really lucky every single rp haven are, are just generally lovely people so it's so nice to be able to chat with new people all the time so so do you think uh, I don't know to what extent you you curate the games at Ro Roleplay Heaven, but do you think the the Roleplay Heaven would support encourage to continue have a online offer to the clubs in parallel to the to the clubs once uh, we go back to normal? Because, air quotes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I think if uh, if our members do want to still be able to use online, I think that it's here to stay you it, it's never going to go away once you start doing something and it and do it well it, it is here to stay but i do think that there is going to be a stage where both are as important as each other um i think the um online clubs will continue but i think once we can go back to our venues i think they're going to be just as popular because what you don't kind of get with online is the same level of interaction with people as you do in the club um, in a club, you can walk past the table and see what people are doing and start a conversation later on with, oh, that looked really great. What was going on? You can't do that online very easily, to be honest. And so that's why they are different beasts. They really are. But they are ones that can work well to, with each other. Yeah, exactly. So that's, kind the, of... that's the thing which is often missing. I mean, I repeat myself on this show, but uh, people tend to oppose things rather than think that they are complementary and they can exist alongside one another and meet different needs and and so on yeah i mean i do think that they can work together um and i think that complementary nature of the of them does mean that it, it's just going to help us grow a bit bigger a bit faster to be honest with you also it's going to be nice for people who aren't yet members of rp haven because they can just join the discord groups um to have a look which is quite nice because sometimes it is a bit scary walking into a club. It Whereas is, online yeah. you can walk in, you know, online you can walk into the server, see what's going on, start to chat to people, and that would help break the ice. Um, we do have new members joining who are actually just joining up who are new online members as far as I can see. So it's I think I think both are here to stay. I'm not sure how big the online bit will be once we go back. But if I'm really honest with the way that the world is at this moment and how it's going on, I don't know when we're going to be back. It's not going to be a quick process either, I don't think. So yeah. it's going to be but iterative. No, well, hmm? It's going to be iterative, uh, in best case scenario. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We had on the show a few people who organized. Uh, I mean, there's two aspects. First, again, the roleplay avenue, you spread across uh, the, the country. Uh, and uh, and second, we had a, a lot of people on the show uh, doing uh, virtual conventions. So I, I don't know if you were planning a, a physical retreat or something, but uh, were there any plans of a ha haven con uh, with all your club branches doing something together, either physically or or now virtually? Um, we were thinking of, of, of and starting to plan to do something, but obviously with all of this, that's kind of uh, we're trying to, um, we're having means trying to figure out how to do a virtual type con, um, but that's a little bit off because there is a lot of logistics behind that. Um, and also we are still, we've just got to a stage now where the online part has run smoothly because to be fair, we've, as I said, we did really well moving everyone online as soon as we had to. But there was a lot. There is a lot of stuff behind the vaccine. So, between us three directors plus our committee members who have been absolute stars, um, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, we might be able to do something because um, Dirk from Grogmeet, uh, he did his virtual Grogmeet uh, a little while ago. Um, so that's something. 
that we could hopefully look at trying to do something similar in the future but um that's a little way off at the moment but it would be great to because also it would be nice to do it as a fundraising for charity yeah um yeah, the the, even... the French convention I took part to, they, they did a, a bundle for people to purchase. And uh, I don't remember how much money, but they gathered quite a, a bit of money for, for a French charity. And uh, they, I mean, so far I did a couple, I I, I played a game at Grogmeet. But uh, yeah, the, it's again, it's something which is interesting and can be complementary to the Dragon Mead, the Expo, especially when they sadly cancelled, like uh, it was announced this week. Yeah, I know. That, that was that was very sad times when I saw UK Games Expo had to cancel. Um, I kind of knew it was going to happen when they yeah, moved to August. I mean... But you kind of were clinging on there because, you know, it's. I always meet everybody there and it's always such a great time uh, to just see what's going on, be able to get a few games in with people you don't see often, and yeah, it was a little bit. I did look at it and go, no, you can't cancel. And I thought, yeah. actually, yeah, I can see why you're doing it. I can see why. And it's fully understandable. But yeah. there is that little part of you that just goes, no. Yeah, I had the guest uh, who previously said, uh, mentioned something about Dragon Meat. She was uh, assuming that it would be cancelled too, and I was like, no, 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 <laughs> let's, let's not rush to make conclusion. Dragon, yeah, Dragon yeah, Meat that's, is that's right at the end of the year. Uh, so, I mean, um, hopefully. I mean, I wouldn't take a bet, but uh, I, I will. Yeah, I mean, it would be very, very, very sad and hard. Uh, in yeah. terms of the duration of the current crisis and uh, and just dragon meat, uh, I mean it's dear to me, it's dear to you, I think. Uh, if yeah. it, it could not take place uh, this year, so crossing I'm... fingers. Yeah, dragon meat was my first ever gaming convention I ever went to, so I just I really would love to go to that again this year. Yeah, same I had to here. miss last year because I was working, uh, so I was really looking forward to this year's one. Um, well, maybe it will be bigger stronger harder than uh all the other years because we people will be uh in dire need of uh, a gaming tabletop gaming convention uh as expo w yeah. w uh, will not have uh, happened uh, we got a question from ichi fee and uh, i picked my book because i don't remember them uh he was asking who, who, <laughs> what is your favorite feng shui Archetype. I don't know if you remember uh, well enough to tell. Oh, um, for Feng Shui, uh, I, my favourite archetype will always be the Scrappy Kid. Nice. Do you play the? I, I. Do you play the it, Scrappy? It's a, it's yeah. a great one. So do you ever? There's a Scrappy Kid also in Star Wars D6, but I never played. Uh, it's, it's never proven very popular in Star Wars for some reason. Yeah, I can't imagine it quite in Star Wars, I'll be honest. Uh, the problem is with Star Wars, you immediately think of the young Anakin, and he was just annoying. <laughs> so, yeah. Well. Um, whereas with the scrappy kid within Feng Shui, I always think of the, the old um, the old sort of black and white films where you do have that little kid who, who you know, is just so awesome. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you remember uh, nice adventures you ran into as a scrappy kid uh, in Feng Shui? Oh, yeah. Um, I think my favourite one was probably the first time I ever played uh, the game. Um, and it was run... Um, it was run at the first ever grog meet. I, um, they did on the Friday night, they did a inaugural sort of like a game before the um, the actual grog meet. And it was literally one table of just one table. Now it's like um, seven tables the night before. But um, first time playing Scrappy, the Scrappy Kid, and we had a and I think the GM thought we were going to do the the going over the rooftops, very uh, ninja style. But the Scrappy Kid's gone, I've got a pocket full of fireworks. We've got a sword master. We can do a show as if we are a holy parade and just go walk straight through the front door. <laughs> the GM kind of gave me that look that said... Right. Uh. <laughs> so we did, <laughs> um, and I still think I think the best one was the fact my character then decided to go running in, skidded. I really, really failed at a point. Skidded right in front of the bad guy. <laughs> 
sort of laying there looking up at this bad guy thinking I was going to to die and he did actually manage to survive that <laughs> it was great fun um really great fun because the rest of the party had to rush in after <laughs> so you've got the you know the bad guys in this temple trying to to I think they were stealing something I can't quite remember what they were doing and they've all had to come running in so these poor guys all they know is suddenly there's a kid on the floor in front of them and the doors burst open <laughs> with our lot it was great fun yeah, I personally only played Feng Shui once. It was at Dragon Meat, uh, closing day. Uh, the, the first year we did the podcast zone, actually, must have, must have been twenty, must have been twenty sixteen or something like that. But uh, yeah, I played the old master. But uh, oh, awesome! But when uh, when I played him, the way I, I sort of reskinned uh, the old master, so that it was set in a team park uh, after closure. And the way I introduced him is he was the janitor cleaning the park. So, awesome. so like, so he was the old, ma an old master of uh, Kung Fu, but, uh, yeah, he was not, he didn't have a lot of money and had to pick little jobs. And, uh, when the action broke out, uh, yeah, he could, he threw, he was wearing his overall and he threw his cap, started fighting with his mop. <laughs> and and did, oh, awesome. did did one thing I don't remember what I think that it was a feat or something if if he was doing something cool uh he would have bonuses so what I did at some point was uh activate the fire alarm and have the the sprinkler make it like it rained I think I think it literally had yeah, something yeah. if it rained or something like that and uh, yeah I went around it by making the sprinkler rain but describing it like very John Woo Hong Kong movie with the water falling and him in his oh, overall with his yeah. bucket and fighting yeah, it was a robot so it was funny to to have the mop very wet and then put it inside the robot and then turn it so the water would drip inside the robot and uh, mess with the, the electronics yeah uh, that's what I just I just love uh the Feng Shui system and the way it goes because it just allows that cinematic um, comedy to be fair. Some of it is comedy as well. Um, I just love love the whole thing. I've, I've never played it as a full length uh, campaign um, and I do know there is time hop, you can do time hopping in it. Yeah, dimension um, hopping of some um, kind, yeah. Yeah, I've, but I've never done that because we've always, we've always played it more like the cinematic style Kung Fu movie type thing. Um, it would be interesting to see what it's like playing it the other way, but I'm not sure whether I'd want to now because I love that cinematic style of it. So one of the I'm not sure the scrappy kid time hopping is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> one of the projects I've got in on the back burner uh, for for a long time. So we've got the side show called uh, the RPG Academy Film Studies, in which we watch a movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about the movie, but also what it can give us in terms of inspiration for games and what games would be the best to play. And the first movie we reviewed was... Uh, and the thing also we like, when we pick a movie, I like to, to make a, a nice little cover and had a subtitle, which is tabletop RPG related, but why related with a movie like for Delicatessen, it became Butchers and Feelings. Uh, mm -hmm. For, yeah, I don't remember the other one, but this one... So the first movie we ever covered was uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf, okay. which is a French movie set in uh, 18th century or, or late 17th century France, uh, but film Kung Fu style, uh, Hong Kong style uh, by a French director who's fan of that. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of and things which are not, uh, which are anachronical, but the alternate title we found for this one was Call of Kung Fu Tulu. And and since then, I would really like to run a Call of Cthulhu adventure using the, the, the Cthulhu Britannica uh, London description, but using mm. Feng Shui as a rule and having something revolving more about uh, the Asian community in Limehouse and, and so on. But use the, yeah. rather than BRP, use the Feng Shui and have it slightly more cinematic. I don't know if Feng Shui deals at all with investigations. I'm not sure it would work. I, I have a feeling it's going to end up a little bit like Scooby-Doo. Yeah, yeah. I have a feeling. 
Um, but I, that's I guess, not a bad thing necessarily. B- b- best case scenario, uh, I'm picturing something in the vein of um, the Sherlock Holmes movie. Uh, what's his name? The director, you know, with Robert Downey Jr. It's sort of it's a yeah. time piece, but at the same time, you've got those fight scenes which are yeah very action packed. Yeah, uh, that could that would be good actually. Um, it'd be interesting to see how the the uh, the mental states go with the characters when they find things that are yeah. Odd. Yeah, that that would be um, that would be the thing of the the sanity rules, unless I host rule them uh, or hack the two systems together. <laughs> so yeah, you you uh you uh you played quite a few French tabletop role playing games. Uh, I was wondering if I was to uh borrow your talents to master a French game for the rollist. Uh, what what French game would you run? Uh, would you showcase? Would that be Shadows of Esteran or something else? Um, I would probably say Shadows of Esteran. Um, I think it, it's a wonderful game. It kind of gets overlooked a little bit because I think Simbran, because Simbran came out roughly at the same time, I think. Did it? Okay. And I think, it, or the translation did. I, I think on Kickstarter they were quite close. And I think that Simbran which is also a brilliant game, kind of overshadowed it a little bit. And it's such a shame because it is, it's a beautiful game. I mean, the books are stunning. And I just like the system of it as well. The world, um, the design of the world, um, particularly because you are characters who are traveling outside your village, um, which isn't normally something that's necessarily done. So there is that, that mythos behind it as well. And, and you don't quite know what's gone on. So I would probably say Shadows. Um, and because I don't think it gets as much love as it should do. Well, and it is such a brilliant thing. I think Shadows of Esther would, would be great. Uh, it won't be right now because, uh, as I was saying, I, I, was, I just finished an actual play, an actual play episode always. So much work for me uh, by my own fault because I, I, I over produce them. Uh, I don't know if people listening to them, uh, please go check out and let me know. <laughs> find them overproduced but in terms of workload uh, i definitely overproduce them but uh, the the agat uh, publishing uh, and shadows of western team they yeah we've been in touch with the rollies to convention several times and uh, they got also uh, their own music which could be used mm. so that, that would allow me not to have to search and not only but also have stuff which is uh, pinpointing uh, the mood so yeah, I, I keep that in mind. We'll we'll make that happen uh, at some point. I mean, if you're keen, yeah. right, would you be keen? Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly more than happily um, do that. Um, it would be it'd be nice to showcase a game like that um, to show people what it's about as well. So yeah, no, more than happy to. And give me a break from doing my usual uh, vampire or wraith. So. Well, you you can. You know what? I, I'm gonna give you the because now I've got even a, a brief for Game Master, so I will send it to you. Uh, well, already uh, maybe uh, this coming week. So knowing that it won't take turn, but you you can already think of your one shot adventure. What what would be nice to fit a a podcast format? Uh, Ichifi was very proactive uh, in the, the chat room. Thank you very much. We got a lot of people in the chat room today. Uh, that's awesome to have you all. Uh, hello, Richard, who is back from a D20 Future show. Uh, he's asking when you are going to run a M- M- Mouse Guard campaign. Mouse Guard. Um, I, I love. Uh, unfortunately, I do love Mouse Guard, the the world. Um, I really don't like the system. Ouch. The system's a bit clunky. Um, because the the world's beautiful. Obviously, you're playing mice um and it is very if you've ever read the red wall books it feels a lot like that in the world the way the world's built you know the, there aren't so many sort of classes you can play but it kind of feels like the type of world and it's a lovely world to go adventuring in but every single time we hit combat or had to to resolve something the system just slowed it all the way down for me personally now that could be i've only played it twice now and it could be because I've only played it twice. Uh, I just find the the resolution system just just kills the mood. You get to a certain point, you're all hyped, and then it's 
just deadens it. It's a pity. So I would, it is, and it is such a pity because I do love what they've done with the world and stuff, but I just don't like the system, which I think is based on Burning Wheel, I think. Okay. Oh, wow. That's interesting I match. <laughs> yeah, I th well, I think it's a watered-down version of it. I'm not 100% certain because, to be fair, by the time I played it the second time, I didn't really do any more research into the rule system. I just started thinking of ways to, to run it with uh, using the Mouse Guard World, but switching it out. And I actually think Mouse Guard World would work really well with the rule set for Tales of Asqueria, for the oh. My Little Pony role-playing game. Because it's got that, you can take a lot of it and sort of and put it into those kind of roles that um, Tails use, I think, personally. That's the game um, I need to play with you, Tales of Equestria. It's a great game for adults and children as well. But um, it's one of those games, whenever I've done it as a one-shot in club, I'm pretty much guaranteed I'll have a full table of people wanting to, to play it. Um, it. It's crazy fun. It really is, but and which is why I think it worked well for Mouse Guard um, because it is quite quick. It allows more role playing, which Mouse Guard it's just brilliant for that. Um, so yeah, I'm probably going to have some very angry comments about how much somebody loves the rules of Mouse Guard. Now. I mean, you know, taste. Uh, it's funny because I've I've heard the uh, criticism of Shadows of Esteran as being kind of clunky, crunchy. Uh, which is not a bad thing in itself. It, it's a question of taste and whether or not it, it fits uh, the world. So yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think with Shadows, the combat is a little bit more crunchier than I would like, but the realism in it is there for a reason because it is quite a dangerous world and it does kind of work. But when you've got um, a turn resolution system in like in Mouse Guard, when we played it with cards, and it slows it all the way down. But you're playing a little tiny mouse. You know, that shouldn't be so slow. You know, you're playing a little mouse with a weapon. You know, you're not a massive human in, in armor or, you know, something that you've managed to get to protect yourself with. So, you know, it's horses for courses. I know that some people really love um, love the mouse guard system. And I do know that if there's one person listening to this that follows me on Twitter, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a few comments when I get back online. Comments is great. You know what? It, uh, you we, uh, That's something I, I'm not doing, but I should do to have more advertisement and more comments from people. I should seek the scandal. Because when you say something uh, obnoxious, suddenly everybody talks about you. I don't know if you've seen the... They made a table of make a team of Marvel characters. And it was yeah. complete nonsense. I mean, two theories out there. Either it was complete nonsense done with the feet, uh, mm. which is a French expression, which I'm not sure works in English, uh, because it was like, I don't know, for $2. Oh yeah, for $1, you had the vision. And uh, you had $15. So yeah, you would take 15 vision then. Uh, and the Black Widow was $5. But either was done with a complete disregard of the universe or it was done uh, especially to have people up in arms because yeah. I heard of this thing everywhere everywhere and most people were negative but rather than pos promote something positively people are more likely to, to rant about something it's it's a pity so yeah you know what Mars Guard the system it's garbage <laughs> put it there Put it there. I said it. Callum from the Race Podcast says, Mars Guard, it's a garbage system. I haven't read it, never read it, but go out there and complain about it on Twitter. Tell people to come check this video where I say, Mars Guard is a garbage system. I, I'm really, I don't, uh, to be fair, where I am at the moment, I'm actually at my mum's because of the, the lockdown. Um, I'm here to help with her shopping and bits and pieces. I'm so tempted to try and find my art equipment that's here, and there will be a little picture of Callum, of Callum as a little mouse <laughs> ranting. You know, I'm sure it would work that all the other stuff I do to promote my show, the people suddenly I will get noticed because you, you got hits. Anyway, yeah, you know, I played a, uh, I played a game. That's a system we could investigate. I, I keep recommending it, although I played it only once, and it's again another thing in the back burner. But there's a system called Fantasy Universal Role Playing System, so it's sort of generic, 
but uh, is that it, like that? So no, it's well, it, well in the sense that it's supposed to be generic, but uh, it's it's much lighter than girls, but it's still a bit tactical. But it's kind of a weird mix of what if uh, fate had a tactical side to it. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, yeah, it's a bit difficult to, but it's a system I would really like to play it more and master it more. Uh, it's just I'm a dilettant and um, I keep moving between projects. But uh, yeah, it's very straightforward, and at the same time, there's a logic to it of uh, characters. And first of all, you play with cards in front of you. So you, when you create a new mm -hmm. thing or a new situation, you write it on a card. Uh, like an obstacle uh, can be a thing and they, they accumulate drama so so it's very descriptive because you one of your action can be okay I'm gonna do that thing to the to the, the thing there and it could be as simple as I just brush my hair and have it float in the wind or you start describing something more uh, technical you're doing but the result in both cases might be that you build up drama so you got one drama die and for each drama oh, okay. die you win, this drama die you're gonna use it for future roles, but not like a, as a one-off, as an ongoing thing, and reducing a, an obstacle or an opponent or losing your drama die oh, okay. is the action of someone or you uh, on that. So the the way they represent it is yeah, like you would see in the movies, there's kind of a build-up. So if it's the more subtle thing, if it's kind of a gumshoe, hard-boiled situation, mm. the the books. I don't find it sell itself very well because the books itself is very medieval fantasy, although the system's got the potential to do to do more. But if it was a hard board gumshoe, it would be your or let's say a die hard thing. You you start, you got zero drama. You just John McLean walking in the street. Then uh, you use your jacket. You're in the white singlet, so you got two drama points and so on. And towards the end, you you got scratches and oh, so okay. on. But you really into the action, but you you worn out by it, and you got visible signs of you being worn out. So th that's kind of the more subtle. If you were less subtle, uh, I think it's a system which would work very well for Japan animation because it would be your Dragon Ball like, uh, okay, zero drama. Uh, Sangoku is having a drink, is uh, eating his noodles, and uh, one drama is uh, the stands. And when you're five drama, you you've gone full super cyan with your hair yellow uh, and so on so and yeah but yeah okay, that sounds quite interesting because uh, it allows it allows everything your character does to build up so, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very free flowing and yet at the same time there's the tactical decision of am i trying to hurt that creature mm. or am i trying to reduce their drama and the way it's interesting is that one way you can lose drama is so you you got you create condition which becomes cards. Uh, so, uh, for instance, going back to John McLean. Uh, okay, John McLean, what do you do? Okay, my action is gonna be. I'm just gonna strafe with my uh, my my. Or oh, the villain's gonna do that. He's gonna, they're gonna strafe and break the mm. the windows, and you got glass everywhere. And then, uh, if the player playing John McLean says, okay. I stand up and I run towards the room. The game master is like, "Oh, wait a second, you forgot. Uh, you got two conditions on the table. You have no shoes and there's glass on the ground. So you lose drama because you 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 hurt your feet doing that. Uh, but if the character instead had said, "Okay, I stand up and walking carefully or jumping on the the desks to avoid the glass, I go to the other end of the room." the player would not lose the drama. So as an architect, okay. what I find very interesting is that you introduce elements in the environment or in the story uh, in which the players are encouraged to include in their description of actions. So they they, they, they got a very active role in it. I, I mean, people should go listen to the... I'm, I'm just self-promoting. But <laughs> there's a RPG Academy... Joshua. There's a RPG Academy trial of Fantagy actual play in which we played a uh, we called that uh, Furry Road because it was like Mad Max Fury Road but mm. I was a uh, opossum uh, no opossum? No, I was an armadillo I was a communist armadillo we had a 
uh, tinkering coyote and yeah we, we were all animals like that and uh, we, we fought other animal gerbils and snakes but with a turtle shaped tank and so on so yeah you, we could make up anything we wanted really and it, it worked it worked quite well yeah okay that sounds quite a nice um catch-all system if you're not sure what you want to play you can just start designing a character and then make then decide what what campaign you want really yeah i, w I wasn't so keen on it at first but uh uh yeah when so this session was paid by the, the designer of the game and he was the game master and when we started chatting before the recording uh, I'm going to post it in the chat the, he started asking us okay we can play in whatever world you want and I as a player I actually find it uh, I, I'm kind of lost if you give me too much li liberty and so yeah. I had to wait for the other players to start coming up Oh wait a minute! We could play anthropomorphic animals, a bit of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Someone came up with the pun, probably at some point, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, and and from that we yeah. things evolved, and uh, yeah, it was a starting in the desert and then ending up in a, a forest community being attacked, like in uh, like in the second Mad Max. Anyway, uh, anything else to plug? Um, and where can people find you and what are your goodbyes? Sorry, I'm cutting short because I need to wake up my son from his daily nap. That's the ongoing subject of uh, Cafe yep. Rollist, which is recorded as my son takes his nap. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, I'm on Twitter um, as Mir for Beer. If not, I am on most of the RP Haven um, social media. Alternatively, find our Discord group, um, which is there is a link to it on our Facebook page um, and also on our website at this point in time. But please, you know, if you're a role player out there and you'd like to reach out and start playing again or even just reaching out to talk to anyone in the gaming community, come join our Discord server. We're all friendly. We don't buy it. Um, it'd be nice to see you. I will include the links in the description of the episode, whether you're watching this on YouTube or uh in audio uh, via our Patreon, uh, or maybe soon I'm gonna release that content in our regular feed. I mean, I should not discourage people to go on Patreon, but uh, I ran a little uh, poll there asking uh, uh, Rollist supporting the show via Patreon if they would mind that I put some of that content uh, in the regular feed. And uh, yeah, uh, six people uh, seems to be keen on that, so six out of 23, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, uh, uh yeah uh, our next guest uh, this friday for once i know it in advance it should be grant owit so that should be interesting uh thank you so much cat for joining uh do everyone go check the roleplay heaven and uh see you bye <laughs>